Hey ACC, we are so excited to get to worship with you again this morning, even from the comfort of your own home. If you've never joined us before, our mission here at ACC is to connect and reconnect people to God, leading them in a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. And one of the ways our church got to gather and do that again this week was through our Young Adults Group's Discipleship Course. It was our first week of two weeks. We talked about how to read our Bibles. We got to see a bunch of faces that we haven't been able to see over the summer, and we just got to fellowship with one another, even from afar, and it was such a blast. I know that in this season, a lot of us are craving community. And so if you're interested in connection, all you have to do is text the word CONNECT to 210-585-4006. And we would love to be able to connect with you throughout this week. Please join Caleb and Callan as we enter into a time of worship. Well, good morning, ACC. We're excited to worship with you today. This is my dear friend, Callan Brown. He's the worship leader at First Presbyterian Church here in downtown San Antonio. He was kind enough to open up his home studio for us today. And it's appropriate because this morning, our songs and our scripture reading are about unity. It's important for us to remember in a season like this that we share so much in common. We have praise in common, we have purpose in common, and we have the promises of God in common. So as you sing with us this morning, despite the physical distance, I encourage you today to embrace the unity we have in Jesus as we sing out our praises today. This is one you know, it's called Here For You. Here we go, one, two, three. Sing with us, let our praise be your welcome today, God. Let our praise be your welcome. Let our songs be a sign. We are here for you. Yes, we are here for you. Let you pray. Fill our hearts with your life. Yes, we are here for you. Yes, we are here for you. And to you, our hearts today. To you, our hearts are open. Nothing here is hidden. And you are our one desire. Shout today, come on. Let our shout be your anthem, your renown. Fill the skies, we are here for you. Yes, we are here for you. Let your word today, let your word move in power. Prayer today, let it fall right where we're at. 
God today one more time. Let it fall. This morning, we're going to read together from Psalm 133. It's a psalm David writes about the unity that we have, the unity that God brings to us. And it says this, Behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. It is like the precious oil on the head running down on the beard of Aaron, running down on the collar of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord has commanded the blessing, life forevermore. I love this passage because it reminds us of where unity comes from. If you look at the words, unity flows down. You know, in John chapter 17, Jesus prays for unity. He prays that we might be one, even as he is one with the Father and with the Spirit. It's a unity that only he can provide. And if you look at this passage, it describes unity as something running down, just like the oil on the head of the high priest, down to his beard and down to his robes. If you look at the way worship happened in Israel, this robe would have been covered with stones representing the tribes of Judah. And so this idea that unity, this blessed unity for those who are called the children of God, it flows down to cover every tribe. In a season like this one, where we have much that separates us, and not just physically, but separates us socially and politically, there's division rampant in society. It's important for us to remember that what we have in common is so much greater than what we might call differences, because we have the unity of Christ as his body, as the church. We are worshipers together. We're called to celebrate this unity. And this is unity that lasts forevermore, as the final verse there says. This is unity that stretches forth into eternity. It's unity that no man could take from us, no political party could take from us, no um, circumstance could take from us. It's eternal unity bought and paid for on the cross and extended to us through the power of resurrection. I invite you today to sing this with us. This is a new song, it's called We Will Feast in the House of Zion. And it's a reminder that the unity we have is not just unity in heaven, where we'll bask together in the glory of God in fullness, but it's unity that we have today in the church. I invite you to sing with us. the f- 
fire He is the Lord our God We are not consumed by the flood Up hell protected gathered up We will feast in the house of Zion We will sing with our hearts restored He has done great things We will say to that that promise is unshakable because as that psalm says, you have decreed it life forevermore for those who are united in you. We thank you today that because the cross happened, because the tomb is empty, we can be united across all social barriers, across all political barriers. We know that those barriers will waste away, but the kingdom of God is eternal. That's where we call ourselves citizens, That's where we call ourselves children. That's where we call ourselves brothers and sisters. We have so much more held together in common than we do separate. And so this morning we take joy in that. We take comfort in that, that what you decree, none can take away. We thank you that we have life and life eternally and life eternally together in you. Bind us together, God. Make us your people establish us as your church and set us forward on mission today in joyful obedience. 
I thank you for this opportunity to worship together, God. I thank you for the unity that we have in singing these songs together and the unity we have in saying today in the name of our King. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you for joining us in worship today. We're going to continue to worship as we open the word together. Okay, try not to laugh, but I was going through a box of old stuff the other day in the closet and I came across this, my old high school basketball team photo. There I am, right there in the middle, number 50, minus gray hair, the beard, and about 27 years. When I found this photo, when I pulled it out of the box, I had so many memories come to mind. I, I thought about all the good times that I had with these guys I thought about the nickname my high school basketball coach gave me. He used to call me Joe Klein. Does that name ring a bell to you? I, I can't imagine it would. Joe Klein was a rather forgettable bench warmer for the Boston Celtics in the early 1990s. So forgettable that one sports writer summed up his entire career like this. He said Joe Klein was never a star, but what made him great was that he accepted his role and was ready to play every night. That pretty much summed up basketball for me. Never a star, but always dressed and ready to play. And if that wasn't enough to keep me around, I was one of maybe three or four players on the team that actually had a car. So I knew if my coach ever cut me, it meant he would have to find another, another ride home for, for four or five guys at the end of the day. There's so much about high school basketball that I would rather forget. But one of the things I think I'll probably always remember is the day our coach passed out our game jerseys for the first time. My senior year, they looked like those Michigan Wolverine Fab Five unis. My coach held up that jersey and he said, men, when you put this jersey on tonight, I want you to know it represents something. When you wear this jersey, it represents this school. When you wear this jersey, it's gonna represent our city. When you wear this jersey, it's gonna represent this team. It's gonna represent your family. This jersey is for you. But make no mistake about it, this jersey represents so much more than just you. So wear it with pride and conduct yourselves accordingly. I bet we've all probably heard a speech or two like that growing up, right? Maybe it was the words of, the, of a parent. Maybe it was the, the content of some employee company handbook. We've all been in those situations where we've been reminded that, that our personal actions have a very public effect. Well, today, as we dive into part three of our series, Exile, the New Testament writer Peter is going to remind us that our faith in Jesus is no exception, that there's a nature to the name we bear. And today, we're going to talk about it. have a Bible close by, I would invite you to go grab it or just pull one up on your phone and follow along this morning in the New Testament book of 1 Peter at chapter 2. Now, if you're new to Alamo Community Church or you're new to this series, for the sake of context, we've spent the last couple of weeks studying together this book written by Peter, one of the original 12 disciples of Jesus. What Peter wrote was written somewhere around 63, 64 AD, and it was originally packaged as a letter sent to men and women who were scattered all throughout what we now know as the northern part of modern day Turkey. And the reason Peter felt so compelled to write what he wrote is that these men and women had fled from their Palestinian homes because they were targets of persecution and, and it all centered around their faith. So they are living in this land that felt foreign to them in every possible way. To put it mildly, life was not going well. And so they faced all the very same temptations that you and I face when, when we reach that place where it feels like it's all starting to come apart at the seams, where nothing is as it should be. They reached that place where, where they were tempted to question God and not just him, but everything about him. They reached the place where, where they looked at their faith and thought, you know, for what? They reached that place where, where they were thinking about, you know, is, is now the time to just throw in the towel, to, to do what everyone else is doing, to live 
like everyone else is living. And yet it's into the middle of all of this that Peter writes to say, guys, listen, if you claim the name of Christ, if you call yourself a follower of Jesus, you got to remember that there's a nature to that name. And before he dives into the uncomfortable, unnatural specifics of what that looks like, he begins by reminding all of us of the name that we bear. Let's look at this together. First Peter chapter two, we're going to pick up in verse four. Peter writes, as you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him. You also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in scripture, it says, see, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious. But to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected, it has become the cornerstone and a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. But you, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. Once, once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. In other words, this is Peter's way of communicating. Do you feel rejected? G guess what? Your Lord felt rejected too. He, he was rejected by humans, but chosen by God. This is Peter's way of saying, I get it. I get it if you look around in your circumstances, tend to lead, lead you to believe that, that you've been forgotten, tend to lead you to believe that, that you're somehow insignificant, but that's not the case. You, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. You are God's special possession. I, I love that he acknowledges in verse 10 that this hasn't always been the case. Peter was writing primarily to Gentile believers non-Jews who knew this wasn't always their story. He said, once you were not a people. Yeah, like once, of course, you were on the outside looking in, but because of God's mercy, you, you are now the people of God. And can I just say to you, if today you identify with Jesus Christ, you call yourself a follower of Jesus, the same is true for you. Peter, Peter's holding up the proverbial jersey to say, make no mistake about it. You are on the team. You bear the name. But what he goes on to say in the following verses, it reminds us that there's a nature to that name, that our identity, it bears a responsibility. Now this, this is where it starts to get a little uncomfortable. Everything Peter is about to say next is essentially an amplification of, of everything Ryan highlighted last week in chapter 1, verses 15 and 16. When Peter, in reference to God, said, he's holy, so we're to be holy as he, our God, is holy. Or as Ryan phrased it, don't you know you're different? Listen to these words. Look down in verse 11. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they may accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits. What's the nature of the name? Peter says part of it is to abstain from sinful desires to abstain from sinful desires. Now, I might be a little presumptuous here, but I don't think this needs a ton of explanation. In fact, if you and I are anything alike, when we hear that, hear that phrase, abstain from sinful desires, it, it probably doesn't bring to mind as much of a, of a big, broad, general characterization of sin as much as it brings to mind 
the very specific individual sins that I find myself succumbing to rather than abstaining from. All that stuff that over time I've, I've tried to explain away or sometimes we rationalize it away as, you know, it, it just doesn't feel like that big of a deal. But Peter writes to remind us here, it is a big deal. It's a big deal because it wages war against your soul. It's a big deal because it's simply not the nature of your name. This has to be at, at, at least part of Peter's m motivation for opening chapter two the way that he did. Listen to what he says, starting in verse one. He says, therefore, rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. Like newborn babes, crave pure spiritual milk so that by it, you may grow up in your salvation now that you've tasted that the Lord is good. I love that phrase, grow up in your salvation. I think this was maybe Peter's way of communicating to you and I. It's, it's time to put on your big boy pants. You see, what Peter knew is that it isn't just inconsistent. It is impossible to deliberately cling to sin and try to cling to God at the same time. One of those things will always take a back seat to the other. And just as it was with Peter's original audience, the more distant God feels, the easier that process becomes. Generally speaking, the, the, the messier, the more complex, the, the more negative the circumstances we find ourselves in, the easier it is to give in. In the moment, it's like us saying, God, I, I believe you're there. But with everything going on around me, I, I'm going to kind of, could you just, could you just look that way for just a little bit? That in order for me to, to uh, pursue this, this deceit or, or this malice that I had planned out, this, this hypocrisy, in, in order for me to pursue my, my greed or my lust, in order for me to pursue my selfish desires, I'm going to have to take a step back from God. Or in some cases, we just flip our relationship with God off altogether, just like it's a light switch on the wall. But what's true of sin is what's always been true of sin. Sin will always take you further than you want to go. It will always keep you longer than you intended to stay. And in the end, it will always cost us more than we thought we would pay. Isn't that true? Sin will always take us further than we thought we would go. It will always keep us longer than we intended to stay. And in the end, it always cost us more than we thought we would have to pay. I bet every one of us can think of a very personal example. Think of someone that we've seen, someone we've experienced where, where one sin seemingly involved in, into an entire season of their life. I know it's true of me, not just from what I've seen, but from what I've experienced, what I've experienced personally. That's why Peter says abstain from it. Because as long as we keep looking for excuses to justify what we're doing, we'll keep finding them. And Peter says, that's not the nature of your name. Now, before we move on, I, I want to pause just a second and ask you about this. Th this is incredibly personal. So, so, you know, don't, you don't have to answer to the people around you, to those who might be sharing a screen with you. But I do want to ask, what is this for you? Like, like what is the sin or, or the reoccurring sins in your life that, that you've, you've just decided to accept as we all fill in the blank rather than abstain from? What is that? Can I just tell you, from one fellow struggler in the journey to perhaps another, whatever that is, whatever those things are, it's not the nature of your name. Now for as uncomfortable as that is, what Peter is about to move on to is perhaps even more so, especially given everything that's currently going on around us. Listen to what he says next. 1 Peter chapter 2, in verse 13, he says, Submit yourself for the Lord's sake to every human 
authority, whether to the emperor as the supreme authority or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and commend those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. Live as free people, but do not use your freedom as a cover up for evil. Live as God's slaves. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God and honor the emperor. The nature of the name, knowing that we're a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, knowing that you and I, we are the people of God. The nature of the name, Peter says, it's to submit to human authority. Submit to human authority. Submit. This word in the original language of the New Testament is, is, a, is a Greek military term that meant to arrange in military fashion under the command of a leader. In just the everydayness of life, it represented a, a voluntary attitude of, of giving in, cooperating, assuming responsibility, or get this, carrying a burden. Now, this idea is so big that we may have to come back next week and, and circle back to this just so that we can give it adequate time and space. But look, I don't have to tell you that you and I, we, we live in a world where we lean hard into our individual rights and our individual freedoms. So, so when we hear terminology like submit, especially coming from a first century biblical writer, our, our tendency is to say, okay, come, come on, Peter, like pump the brakes, for just a minute. Like, I, I get it, you, you live in Bible land where everything is prim and proper. You live in the Bible world where stuff like this is just a good you know, bumper sticker sentiment to, 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 to follow, to, to live by. But that's not the world we live in. And in fact, like if you had any idea of what's going on right here, right now, I think you might change your mind. If you knew their, their political agenda and what they're trying to push through, if, if, if you knew what, what they were thinking, how they were acting, if you knew about, about the holes in their character, and I'm not just talking like little tiny lapses, I'm talking like, have you seen the Grand Canyon kind of gap? If you knew about my HOA, I mean, come on, Peter, just hop in your DeLorean, come back to the future, step into our world, and I'm guessing you're gonna rethink all of these submit kind of ideas. So listen, I get it. The more distant we are from Peter's first century culture, the more ridiculous this sounds. But hear me out. Democrat, Republican, Libertarian, wh whatever your angst is with this, it does not compare. It doesn't even come close to the reality of it for these first century Christians. You see, Peter wasn't writing to a, a, a group of, of men and women who were living in the land of the free and the home of the brave. Peter was writing to a group of men and women who had fled from their homes. And now the very thing that they thought had they had escaped, it, it has reappeared in their current location. And the crux of it, the crux of it was all about that tension between faith and for them, a government that was very, very anti Jesus. Nero. Nero was their emperor for crying out loud. You remember him? We talked about this a couple of weeks ago. Nero was, was the emperor who, who liked to take Christians and feed them to the lions as entertainment for his guests. Nero was the guy who, who would take Christians and he would have them tarred and impaled on poles and he would light them up to, to light the night sky for his elaborate dinner parties. It's into this world it, it's into this corrupt government system that Peter writes these words, submit to every human authority. And I could only imagine just because the people who received this letter were human, just like you and I, I could only imagine they would raise a hand and say, hey, Peter, um, okay, I hear what you're saying, but just even Nero, and I think Peter has written as if to respond, 
especially Nero. This one, this one is hard. I don't know about you, but this is one of those things where, where I think if God would, if I could somehow convince him to be okay with it, this is one of those things I would just like to take a hard pass on. Because we don't have to look very far to, to find an office, uh, to find a, a, a legislative leader, to find a, a, a political leader, to find someone in authority around us that we look at and we just go like, eh, I'm not all that sure you're worthy of submitting to. Like you don't have godly character, your actions, your behavior, the way you treat people. Come on, like surely God wouldn't want me to, to carry the burden for that. And it's as if from the pages of scripture that Peter would say, look, you may not like anything they do. You may not agree with anything that they say, but dishonor and disrespect are against the nature of your name. And I know we all want to say amen when it's our guy or our girl that's in leadership. But come on, isn't it true? We all have a tendency to find an excuse or just to completely ignore this altogether when they aren't. That's why I, that's why what Peter said in verse 16, I, that's why it resonates so loud. I think especially with us as Americans, when he said live as free people, but don't use your freedom as a cover up for evil. Live as God's slaves. Now, now that's, a, that's a pretty big word picture there, isn't it? Live as God's slaves. In other words, look, don't confuse your political leanings and your political tendencies with your ultimate identity. Don't confuse your nationalistic rights with God's divine will. Let me see if I could draw the net a little bit tighter. Don't assume just because you can create a social media post or you can respond to a social media post that you should respond or create a social media post. Peter says, show proper respect to everyone. Everyone, that's about as all encompassing as it can possibly be, right? Show proper respect to everyone, to the people who, who look like you and think like you and believe like you and vote like you, and to those who couldn't possibly be any different from you. Peter says, show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God and honor the emperor. Now, we may all come at this politically from, from different views and different vantage points. But the thing I think we could probably all agree on is that all governments in all parties for all nations in all times have always been led by broken people who do broken people kinds of things. And listen, that's not, a, that's not an attempt to excuse or justify their behavior or inactions. It's not to say that you and I shouldn't do what we can, when we can, to be agents of change for, for what's true and for what's right. Goodness, it's not even to say that, that we shouldn't take advantage of the, of the opportunity to vote them out of office, whatever that office is, if given the chance. What this is about is our attitude and approach in the meantime. Our attitude and approach when we love who they are and what they represent. And our attitude and approach when we can't stand it. This is about understanding that your ultimate representation isn't as a Democrat or Republican, but it is as a, a follower of Jesus. Or to borrow Peter's terminology, a slave of God. That's why he makes it clear. But you and I, we're to do this, not for our sake, not for the sake of our nation, but we're to do this for the Lord's sake. And if that sounds odd to you, let's just be real. It is, it is odd. But when we actually live this out, it is so odd that people, they take notice. 
look, I don't have to tell you that griping and complaining, spewing your opinions and, and our ideas, all that stuff, that doesn't make us unique. Those things make us just like everyone else. But submitting ourselves for the Lord's sake, well, that's different. That is unique. And according to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 12, according to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 15, it opens a unique door of opportunity to the world around us. And again, I get it if you say, I don't like it. Like for real, I do. I get it if in some way all of this, we read it and it, it just comes across as, well, but that's unfair. I get it if you think, why should I have to do what, what no one else even thinks of doing? Why should I have to suppress my rights? Why should I have to suffer? Well, fellow slave of God, Peter wraps up chapter two by perhaps giving us the answer. Verse 21, he writes, to this you were called. To this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but now you've returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. In other words, why would I do this? Peter says, look, it's the nature of your name. The late great Christian philosopher Dallas Willard once wrote that our faith, it's filled with what he called vampire Christians. In his words, these are people who say in effect to Jesus, I would like to have a little of your blood, please, but I don't care to be your student or to have your character. In fact, won't you just excuse me while I get on with my life and I'll see you in heaven? Dallas Willard poses the question, is this really acceptable to Jesus? And from the pages of 1 Peter, the answer comes with a resounding no. That the centerpiece of our faith isn't about you and I reaching a place where we live to satisfy ourselves. It's rather found in you and I reaching a place where we learn what it means to die to ourselves. And listen, that's not easy. It's not popular. It doesn't come with the promise of, of health and wealth, cloudless days and starry nights. But if you choose to bear the name, if you take the proverbial jersey and you wear it, remember it's for you, but it represents so much more than just you. So live accordingly. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, with all the humility that I have in my heart. God, I ask that you'd help me to live this out and live it out well. God, I, I pray that I would constantly be reminded of what the Apostle Paul wrote when he, when he said that you're not your own, that you've been bought with a price. Jesus, I know that's true. And I pray that for me, for the men, and women of Alamo Community Church, we would live out that truth in a way that makes you proud. That we would live out that truth in a way that according to 1 Peter chapter 2, would cause the world around us to somehow look at us and see you. It's in the name of our Lord we pray. Amen.
Hey, in just a minute, you're gonna have an opportunity to work through a handful of questions related to today's sermon content on the Ramp Guide. Speaking of that, if you would like to discuss today's message even further, I would invite you to join us this Wednesday night for The Collective. The Collective is an online environment that offers the opportunity for additional dialogue with others from our church community. One last thing before we go. If today this message strikes you at a place where you're wrestling with faith or wrestling with God, um, if it strikes you at a place where you're wrestling with submission and authority or just the craziness that exists in our world of politics, and you would like for somebody to pray with you or answer your questions, I want you to know we'd love an opportunity to do that. One of the best ways you can do that in this season is to simply text the word prayer to 210-585-4006. We'd love the chance to follow back up with you. Now, on to that ramp guide. Hey, ACC, thanks for tuning in this Sunday. If you're watching us on Facebook, make sure to like the page. If you're watching us on YouTube, make sure to subscribe. That way you get updates to all of our future services. As Kevin said, our identity in Christ bears a responsibility. So this week, as you navigate your faith, make sure you're wearing the right jersey. <laughs> oh no, that, that's not right. Hold on. Boom, baby. Hey, CC, as you can tell, we are in our new building. And so as we await the completion of this, we can't wait to gather with you again. But one of the things we're most excited about is serving together again. And so I wanted to remind you of the few of the incredible ways you can join us in serving at ACC. From our brand new hospitality team, including greeters or the cafe behind me, to our prayer ministry, to our kids in student ministry, there are incredible opportunities for you to get involved in the days ahead. In the next coming weeks, you're gonna hear more about opportunities to meet with those teams and to train with those teams, but there's only one way you can get involved. You've gotta apply. If you're interested in joining one of our service teams at ACC, you can check out our ACC app and under the serve tab, you will find every opportunity for you to apply for a ministry. Hey, thank you so much for your continued generosity in this time. In a season of such uncertainty, you guys have been incredible. And I wanna remind you that every time you give to ACC, you give through ACC. So if you would like to continue in worship today through giving, you can do so on our PushPay app or by writing a check and mailing it to the address posted below. Hey, thanks so much for tuning in. We can't wait to see you again, but until then, next week continues our Exiled series.